so we are this afternoon um, we're going to be looking at my um, <clears throat> my title that I've given today was Moses the mediator of the covenant um, and uh, um, while I was praying about it um, in the days leading up to this teaching session I was I was really just wanting uh, because I love I love the Old Testament I love that the first 30 years of my life in the church I've kind of just been taught the New Testament um, which is wonderful and over the last maybe five years I've been on a mission and I've just been reading the Old Testament uh, because it's been laying this incredible foundation for understanding a lot of the things if the New Testament so I'm kind of, I wouldn't say I'm an Old Testament buff, but I definitely love it. Um, I love the time it takes to lay down a principle or um, talk about um, part of the, na the nature of God and his characters and his ways. It's much more story based, where the New Testament kind of comes at you a bit like a slap in the face. It's, it's like one liner that a lot of preachers will spend a lot of time trying to unpack. Um, uh, that's because those one-liners are speaking of something in the Old Testament. So I've kind of just been lost in the Old Testament for ages. Um, and I was really, I was really asking Jesus. I was like, well, we could just talk about the Old Testament. I could just teach from that. But obviously, the question in my, in us today, other than laying foundation or bringing revelation. Uh, what is what is today's title going to leave us feeling and and I and I want to home in because obviously you all know that again I'm on a journey of not only Old Testament but of learning about our Jewish roots. Um, so the application for today's discussion, and it will probably spill into next week, is um, the God-given assignment uh, to repair the world, or redeem the world, or reconcile the world. That's the kind of language used in the old and new, is um, that nothing belongs to Satan. He never created anything. He doesn't have ownership over anything. Everything was created by God. It's all held together by God. It was all for by him and in him as its being and is held together. Um, so the whole concept for me, um, if I can talk about a musician, some of you are old enough to know that drums were probably of the devil uh, 20 years ago in churches, maybe 30 years ago, apparently. Um, and now we're kind of okay with drums being used in church. Um, but the whole principle there is drums and rhythm and the sound that's created when you hit a stick on a skin, that was made by God. It hit the physics. Where the enemy has taken something called it his own and then the church kind of were like whoa well that's that's camp. the process of redeeming repairing or reconciling the, those things would be to take back that which has been stolen um and now all of worship and so so the application for today's study is looking at um the assignment to redeem and see the earth fully restored um so we're going to read um quite a bit of scripture together to start with um and um uh there we go i'll just put it in the chat again um so why don't we why don't we kind of take if you've all got your bibles we're going to start in exodus 19 we're going to lay a nice juicy foundation um, and we're going to read, I think it probably worked out maybe 12 verses each and um, we'll just go, we'll just go round um, my screen on WhatsApp and we'll just read the word together. Um, now before we dig into that, um, most of you should know or hopefully um, that today is uh, the 6th of Sivan, which is Pentecost. Um, Pentecost doesn't actually fall on a Sunday. It actually falls on a specific date. 
um, not the nearest day to that date. So actually, from 7 p.m. last night to 7 p.m. tonight, um, and the day after, so two days they celebrated the Jews, it's actually Pentecost. Now, what's interesting um, at the Feast of Pentecost, we, as the church, um, celebrate yes. the giving of the Holy Spirit, right? It fell on the disciples. Um, and then Peter got up and preached an amazing message. And I think 3, we may have just lost. Are you, are you back with me? Uh, I can hear you. Is my connection really bad? Oh, yeah, you may just want to keep your camera just for a little bit, just because it's breaking up a little. Um, so maybe if you drop your camera off and just go to audio for now, and then we'll okay. see if that clears up a little bit later. Okay. Oh, um, okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see me. Sorry, we are trying to get this um, internet speed connection fixed. Um, so hopefully that'll be over the next few weeks. Um, so yeah, so what was I saying? Um, Pentecost today, um, and uh, we celebrate it as the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Jews celebrate it as the giving of the Torah um, at Mount Sinai. Um, and Jews traditionally are today will um, be celebrating the reading of the Ten Commandments. Um, they may stay up all night and read the Torah throughout the night. They will read from the book of Ruth um, and uh, they ultimately uh, celebrate the, um, the betrothal uh, by God in Egypt through the Passover and the Red Sea um, and uh, the gift that was given at Pentecost. And uh, they actually stay at Mount Sinai, from what I can understand, um, for nearly three months. Um, all the way until what we now know is uh, the fall feasts or the feasts in the autumn um, where they actually um, go through a wedding ceremony with God. So the Jews actually traditionally um, today will be starting to celebrate um, the marriage um, to Yahweh at Mount Sinai, which is all very exciting. And the way they see it is they believe that every Jewish soul um because they're all connected to each other, they were all there at Mount Sinai together. It's an amazing joint responsibility um, and commitment to Yahweh. And uh, they inherently believe that they were all at Mount Sinai together, um, which is incredible, the strength that that kind of thinking brings to, in terms of endurance um, of, a, of a faith um, today. So they'll actually be starting to celebrate that. And if you tuned in to my um, communion uh, on the morning before Pentecost, um, which was yesterday, it's all a bit confusing with the Jewish day starting at 7 p.m. I was talking about um, the betrothal for us as the church, um, us at, uh, as the church, we were betrothed um, to Jesus um, by partaking in communion, the Passover meal, uh, the four things that happen, um, the skin of wine, the, the contract, the bride price, and then the gift that's left the bride while the groom goes away, that gift being the whole gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Um, the Passover lamb, the, the, the price that was paid for her, um, uh, the contract of his intention to be their God and his to be their people, and then the gift, again, that was given at uh, Pentecost, which for them is the Torah. Um, and it's really interesting to me, if you you can have some fun with this, just with Holy Spirit, um, asking yourself, what's the relation between the two gifts that were given, of the Torah and um, and the Holy Spirit? And the paradigm, remember, is the gift that is given to the bride before the groom goes away. So that gift naturally is going to want to speak of who he is, um, remind the bride of who he is, um, help her get prepared. So it could be a sum of money so she could buy a dress. Um, it would be a comfort to her. 
um, it would it would yeah it would reveal and speak of his nature um, if it's more of a personal gift. Now these descriptions, as you were already feeling on the back of your head, speak very much of the Holy Spirit, and the Torah is the same thing. It speaks of the nature of God, His intention, um, the gift of comfort, the blessings that would be there. Um, and so it's very interesting this this duality uh, that's happening um, between the old. Now, what I wanted to focus in on was um, they cherish the Torah. So today we um, we are going to read very large portions um, of Exodus because I'm going to be asking us a question after this. And we're going to go into probably maybe just two breakout rooms, maybe more. Um, and the question I'm going to ask is, um, what was what was the purpose of the covenant? Or what, in a big picture sense, what what is its purpose? And uh, we're going to think of the multi-layered uh, answer to that question because I believe there's quite a few. And then we're going to kind of rock it on from there as to how we apply that to um, the God-given assignment. And and the here's here's the thing I'm going to give you land on. Hopefully, is Everything that's in the Old Testament is is almost made new in the New Testament. Um, and uh, we have keys and authority and a gift given through Jesus that makes the task um, possible. Um, so that, that's kind of how, so whenever we go Old Testament, don't kind of throw out the window of it. it I believe it builds the foundation and often sets up the need for something that is missing that comes in Jesus that makes everything make sense. So let's go to Exodus 19. Lost uh, Russell again. Let's just give him a second, uh, see if he reemerges from the ether. Um, has everyone else lost him as well? It's not just me. <laughs> oh, what did what was the last yeah. thing everyone heard? I heard everything, but I couldn't, I can't see you. Yeah, that's fine. I've turned off my video yeah. at the moment, so it helps with bandwidth. Yeah. You know what, I'll, I will just ask, could everyone else just um, switch off the videos if you know how, I don't know how I can do it for you. We'll just try and free up some uh, bandwidth and maybe Russell can put his back on and, and we'll see if that, uh, we'll see if that helps at all. Yeah, that's a good point. That's it, cool. And if you just um, all mute your mute your microphones as well, that might almost help. Can everyone hear and see me now? Uh, oh, you can't reply because you've all got your microphones muted. Everyone's, everyone's muted, but yeah, I think I, can I think hear you, Russell, but can't see you. Go, Russ. Only hear you. <laughs> okay, all right. Hopefully, this won't turn into a nightmare. I can um, see you now. I can see you now. Okay. Cool. Um, right. We so, all... okay. Here's what we're gonna do. Um, actually, this will probably work well because you guys might have good, better internet connection. Um, let's start with um, let's start with David because you are um, uh, top left of my screen. So, David, could you read Exodus 19, um, verse one through to let's say verse 15? Under 15. At Mount Sinai, I take my glass off and I see better. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, 
we would do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Make them wash their clothes and be ready for the third day by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No personal animal shall be permitted to live. Only when man's only when the ram's horn sound a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down to the down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, "Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations." Great, thanks, David. Okay, um, Maddie, are you are you okay to read from? 16 all the way through to the end of the chapter all the way up to 25 yeah thanks yeah on the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast everyone in the camp trembled and Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spake, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so that they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Oh, Even the priests okay. who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Great, thanks Maddie. Um, okay, uh, Ian, Maggie, Mum and Dad, you're next on my screen. So if you could, between you, read um, the Ten Commandments. So chapter 20, I'm going to go verse 1 all the way through to 21. So about 10 verses each. Okay, well, Dad's not here at the minute, so I'll do it. Okay. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or even serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honour your father and your mother, 
that the days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything else that is your neighbour's. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us, we will hear you, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. To 20, was that as far as Great. you wanted me to go? Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's good, yeah, no, that's fine. 21 just says, the people oh, yeah. remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was at. Cool, thanks, Mum. Um, okay, Kate, um, let's flick through to Exodus 23 now. And if you could read um, 20 to 33, is that okay? Just 13 chapters. So Exodus yeah, 23, verse 20 to 33. Lovely. Okay. Uh, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive rebellion since my name is in him if you listen carefully to what he says and do all that i say i will be an enemy to your enemy and will oppose those who oppose you my angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the amorites hittites perizzites canaanites hivites and jebusites and i will wipe them out do not bow down before their gods worship them or follow their practices you must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces worship the lord your god and his blessing will be on your food and water i will take away disease from among you and none will miscarry or be barren in your land i will give you a full lifespan i will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will give into your hands the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me because the, people, the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. Great. Okay, cool. And then lastly, Joe, are you okay to read um, Exodus 24? Um, are you happy to do 1 to 18? Yeah, that's fine. Great. Now he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near nor shall the people go up with them with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins 
and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. And Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they, saw the Lord, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you, if any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Wow. Okay. I don't know about you, but I just, there's something so precious about just reading the word and especially today, just uh, when Maggie, when you were reading through the Ten Commandments, there's just something really beautiful about cherishing those scriptures. I mean, that is essentially the, the moral law for every, pretty much every Western government in the world. Um, it's just incredible. Um, okay, now before I teach on any of this, um, uh, what we're going to do is, uh, me and Tom are going to view into um, three groups of three, um, and uh, I want to just chat between yourselves for about seven minutes maybe, um, and from what we've read, just I'd love to hear your thoughts on what do you think the purpose of this covenant is? is again remember touching on the fact that it is multifaceted but what do you think what is god doing here like why is he drawing them into this into this thing this covenant what what's his purpose for it um, with them through them to them to the world however whatever angle you want to look at so um i don't know how easy or quick that is to do maybe you could put yeah, me and you they're all set up and ready right. to go, so just give the word. Okay, all right, so you've got just five, seven minutes um, just to come up with a couple of things that you think was the purpose of this covenant that God gave to the Israelites. All right, off you go. Okay, we've got one group back. The other six have disappeared. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, great. All right. Hi. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so um, I probably should have said, oh, nominate a speaker um, from each group. But um, 
Let's see. Uh, Vina, you're now um, on my top left. I don't know what group you're in, but uh, are you happy to just give us a couple of a couple of things um, to answer the question of what the purpose of the covenant you guys felt was? Don't forget, all your microphones are unmuted, so just pop them pop them open again so we can all hear you. All right. So. Um, thanks, Russell. I was I was with your mum and David in the oh. group, so it was a, it was a joint it was a joint um, discussion and <laughs> answering session. Um, so uh, for me, I, I had the image of, um, of of a wild horse being caught in a coral, and um, and its master trying to tame it, but very gently and with a lot of love, and to, to say, you know, trust me, I'm trying to take you know the wild out of you, but I'm caring for you and and that sort of, you know, hone it until to a point where the horse would come to the master and eat from its hand and just say, you know, I know that you want to be free, but um, there's this relationship that we're going to have, which is going to be so much better. And, I would, and, and so we were likening that to the bride of Christ uh, uh, and what they actually in the Old Testament, the bride um, of, of Yahweh. And uh, what we were saying, it's sort of what they're doing with this covenant is sort of wedding the path for the new covenant with Jesus coming and, and his bride. Nice. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, great. Thanks, that group. Um, let's see, uh, Joe, whose group were you in nominating you as the spokesperson? <laughs> Thanks, Russell. I was with uh, Sally and Maddie. Um, what was the purpose of the covenant? Um, well, we, we did talk a little bit about lots of things. <laughs> I'm not sure we got the answer to your question. Um, so for me, it was he wanted to separate the people, the Israelites, so that they would um, separate to be his bride, you know, and the Ten Commandments were in effect his um, bridal ketubah that they would follow. And when you look at the bigger picture, he needed a he needed a group of people that he would trust to, to keep all of those laws so that the ultimate salvation would come through Jesus because if they hadn't kept those laws and they hadn't been a religious people that kept the law, Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether that's the answer to your question, but that's what we talked about. <laughs> yeah, no, great. Love it. Yeah, love it. Good. Okay. And then the last group, um, Geraldine, are you happy to share from your, your group? Um, basically, what we discussed was how precise um, the, the covenant was, the preparation, the actual covenant being given, and then um, you know the instruction to 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 the chosen people as to, with regards to them following and observing the covenant. Um, so. <laughs> Um, what else did we discuss? We did mention the shedding of the blood and related that to Jesus Christ. But um, this was difficult for us because we were trying to understand the question as well. Um, but I think what we came away with was, as Kate actually said as well, she said, um, after all of that, the, the, the people didn't actually um, obey. But what, one of the things that did come up, which we also discussed, was it was interesting how precise the instructions were and how till today uh, the the Jews actually do follow that precisely and in fact if the instructions had instructions had been wishy-washy then down the generations we would not have the Jews wouldn't have what they have today and um, so in a way it was good that um, the instructions were as precise as they were uh, you know I'm sorry I'm not sure if we actually if we actually answered the question um, no, it's good. That's good. No, that's wonderful. Um, I mean, coming up with the question is always difficult when in my head I feel like I've got some of the answers. But no, you've all touched on some of the things that I have also been thinking. Um, we've mentioned things like um, Israel is now viewing their relationship with God through a bridal lens, which is super important to understanding some of the seemingly harsh things possibly that happened to the Israelites when they break the covenant. Remember that a covenant, and we won't have time to talk about it today, um, is based on two parties agreeing on a set of terms, and you see that in the scriptures we've read, and then blessings 
and curses are pronounced to say, if you keep my covenant, this is going to happen. Mm. Um, if you break my covenant, this is going to happen. Because and, and the language then God moves into, um, especially when you come across the book of Hosea, um, uh, I, was, I was like a husband to you, says the Lord. Um, this, this covenant is one of the things it is. It's the very foundation of the concept of idolatry um, at being uh, adultery. Um, because God says, don't go after any other gods. If you do that, it's like you're, you're chasing after another, another lover. Um, so, so from that bridal lens, it's, it's very important. And it's interesting to me, like I've, I keep on saying, that that concept of the bridal lens that happens here, for me anyway, doesn't feel like anyone's ever talked about it being carried over into Jesus's time. Um, some of you have touched on... Um, Essentially, and this came up with Tommy, which is really interesting. The other day, he started talking about moving from the tribal mindset to becoming a nation. And um, if I can make some sweeping generalizations just to frame this concept, um, tribalism is about me and my people. Um, we move about as wanderers. We are usually um, a warrior type of people. If we see something, we'll take it and attack that other tribe. Um, and that's how we survive. Lots of stealing, lots of, lots of war, lots of disagreement, lots of movement. Where um, a nation, when you found a nation, you have to move from tribalism and plant yourself somewhere. You are then less involved in attacking people you become more involved in your water source and your walls, defending your people, and then you start agriculture. And um, actually, if, you, if I could make an even bigger sweeping generalization, if you look at a lot of um, uh, the Middle Eastern culture, um, uh, all in the Middle East, uh, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, um, and even in Africa, they are still very tribal mindsetted. They have struggled to form into a nation um, where they plant themselves and think long term. So that's interesting. And uh, from this this movement from tribal to national, if I can put it that way, um, starts picking up this concept of what I would assume is one of the purposes of this covenant is to give them a platform to extend the kingdom of God. To They are essentially re-picking up the mandate that was given to Adam um, in the garden to extend the boundaries of the garden so the whole world is again covered in the glory and this, uh, this relationship with God. We know that was lost um, because some of the language that we read in Exodus was, I'm not going to give you everything. Um, in a year because you don't have the capacity to essentially fill your boots. Um, this is going to take time so you can expand my domain, the king's domain, across every area that I'm going to give your feet. Another thing that this covenant establishes is actually a pivotal point in what I would call the pattern of salvation. Um, now, if you think about this, um, the, the story from, from Exodus, from Egypt, when I talk about Exodus, I, sorry, forgive me, I'm interchanging between the book and, uh, and the exiting of Egypt. So, so from Egypt, they belonged to one kingdom. God, like Joe said, there's this process of sanctification where he's asking a people, remember, sanctified means to be set apart for a holy purpose. That's what a bride will do when she says yes to her lover. I'm setting myself apart from any other lover. I choose you. There's that process of drawing from one kingdom to another. Um, uh, and then you've got the baptism, if you could call it that, through the Red Sea. Um, uh, and then you kind of move on to this relationship um, mountain encounter. Um, and then you move on into the promised land. Um, and uh, you get this pattern of salvation um, where you, you leave one kingdom to become part of the kingdom of God. You, and that's only through, remember, the blood of Jesus, the Passover lamb. Uh, and then you go through baptism. 
um, which is the washing away where, where you completely have come and are never going back to the, your old ways. Um, uh, that's your dedication. And then there's this personal relationship. Um, and I think, again, some of you guys have said it, um, this covenant is the Jews. And this is where I've talked before that we often think or can think, you know, the Jews are just about the law. We're all about grace, but actually, uh, actually, the concept of grace. This is a little rabbit trail, so I'm going to be careful here. Is or is was originally set up in the Old Testament, um, and like I said before, there's more laws in the New Testament that are of the 613 uh, uh, laws of the Torah. So, you know, that that's just a whole little side note. But remember, they the Messiah had to come from from the israelites um so god needed a people that protected you're right this precise giving of the law that they had to guard for th six thousand years um and this is why it's still very alive today um now i i'm going to read um a passage um from a book um uh, on uh, now i'm not going to pronounce it right because i'm not uh, Jewish. I should probably figure out how to pronounce it, um, but I'm not that smart right now. Um, it's called T uh, Tikkun Olam, uh, and it and it translates as repairing the world. Uh, the Jewish religion is founded on the divine assurance and human belief that the world will be perfected, but but the final ideal state will not be bestowed upon humans by some miraculous divine feat. God alone is the divine ground of life, but has chosen a partner in the perfection process. That's you and me. The ultimate goal will be achieved through human participation. Um, the mandate that they believe, uh, the Jews believe, was given at Mount Sinai was that extent, the concept of extending the king's domain across the world. That everything that was once lost will be repaired will be redeemed by God, um, that the sin in the world would ultimately be annihilated. And, and they are partnering with this, and they believe the pivotal moment will come when their Messiah arrives. What was interesting to me was that I didn't realise that the, the Jews over the, over the millenniums have um, sometimes thought their Messiah has come. If you do some research on Google, there's specific Jewish names of, of guys that, that in their eyes were so um, encapsulating what they thought the Messiah would look like. They thought it, it was him. Um, and we know through our study that uh, the scriptures are almost split as to the nature and character of this Messiah. There is the conquering king Messiah. And then the thing that they that they struggled to reconcile with was the suffering servant Messiah. Now remember, in in their view, there wasn't a first coming and second coming concept of the Messiah. Um, so they needed a king when they were under Roman occupation. So when Jesus comes as a suffering servant, as the Lamb of God the first time, they just couldn't reconcile those two concepts together. Um, now, We're going to pick this up again um, next Friday, and and if you are able to join on, we would have done the groundwork with our readings today. Um, but what one thing I would like to leave you with this question to go away with today, and that is this concept of of tribal um, to national, uh, and I think the kingdom of God looks more like a national. Um, identity model rather than a tribal one um, because it is extending the king, king's domain it's extending uh, it's all about reaping and sowing um, remember tribe tribalism they they attack and take nations plant and harvest um, a, a tribe focuses on building weapons and plundering and a king builds walls and water and um, I, I'm gonna jump ahead now a little bit um, I know this is a bit of a funny route but but I feel like this is something to be highlighted is um, the question and this is this is something that um, that comes up that, has, that came up at Bethel 
and I want to put it in a bit of context because it's almost contrary to what I've just said, but there's, there's a distinctive difference. The question I'd like to ask you is who is your tribe? Who are you running with? They, we know that there are good people, bad people and right people on our journey. Um, finding, we know bad people, we shouldn't run with them, but there are some just, there are some good people and there's the right people. Um, and knowing who are just good people can often be a distraction to running with the right people. And I want to put that in the context of your tribe. Who do you feel, where do you feel like you most belong? Now, a lot of your answers would probably be, well, catch the fires like my tribe. I identify with their values and things like that. Understanding what's in you, what, what you connect with is really important to finding the right people to run with. And one of the greatest um, examples of this in the Bible is when Joshua, um, and it, there's a large portion of scripture from Joshua 13 to Joshua 21, um, is the division of the promised land amongst the 12 tribes. Um, and, uh, and it's very interesting to me um, as to how this was done. And and if you, if you have time to plough through those, those chapters... Um, those almost 10, 10 chapters, you will start getting the sense that each tribe had an identity. Um, some were warriors, um, some were shepherds, um, some were bread makers, some were, were carpenters. And you kind of, kind of get this feel that they all had their unique identity. And, and here's the analogy that, that sits really well um, for me and for us when we came back from Bethel was who, who are we running with because there's no there's nothing worse than than being in the wrong tribe and in the wrong land if you're a warrior and you're with the shepherds you're just going to get frustrated with all the tending to the sheep if you're a shepherd and you're with the warriors and the warriors are just about to take a city for God you're going to feel pretty uncomfortable about it and there's this there's this there's this there's this identity that we need to find within ourselves about who do we belong with who do we run with what land should we be in and what people should we be running with now all of this interestingly enough doesn't mean that we can then go into this sense of tribalism because we are all in our tribes part of the kingdom of god which is all about extending the king's domain planting seeing harvest taking times time for it to grow and the tribe of levi some of you will know if you are good bible students they weren't apportioned any part of the land they had uh, i think it was six cities they were called cities of refuge um, and they had the temple in jerusalem as well that was part of their inheritance they they would always serve before the lord and be in his presence now i'm going to i'm going to leave you with 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 this kind of this concept of the covenant being given to set a platform for all those things we've talked about but also this identity that they now had um, remember there wasn't really much moral law god really had to start from the basis of teaching a whole nation how to become the kind of people that could one do relationship with him and two be partners in seeing the world repaired but what's interesting is that they were still tribes but they had took on a national identity now we know that ended up breaking down um, but for you one thing i'd like you to go away and contemplate um, before we've even had time to dig into moses being the mediator of the covenant and how uh, Moses is like Jesus because um, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant we'll get onto that next week but just start asking yourselves and I know it's quite a loose question who are my tribe who do I identify do I do I maybe let me put it like this I don't want to box it into this but do I buzz when I'm with the evangelists or do I buzz when I'm, we're talking about pastoral issues and obviously that's just framing it into the fivefold how about this? We talked about the, what I believe, the nine mountains of influence. You know, I buzz when I'm around entrepreneurs and businessmen, but, but I get really swamped when I have to dig into education or healthcare. Like, who are your tribe? Who, what makes you come alive? What makes you buzz? And then what land should you be in? Um, what, where should you be positioned? Um, because if, if I'm a 
if I'm, let's put it another way, if I'm a, an evangelist and I just want to preach, but the land I'm in is uh, down south in Sussex with the David's Tent tribe, they're all worshippers. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing sweeping um, analogies. They're all worshippers. If I'm in their land, I'm also in the wrong place. It's not just about tribe, it's all about land. And even if you found your tribe, if you were all evangelists, but found yourself in the wrong land, then that's just as it's frustrating. So I'd love to get your thoughts next week as to how you identify your, your tribe, the land that you feel like you should be positioned in, and then how that identity starts forming this, this sense of nation, not tribalism, where it's extending the kingdom and the, and the underlying platform is this bridal marriage with the king of the universe who wants partners in repairing the world. Um, and then uh, next week um, we, we'll pick up um, some other things because when you kind of get this concept of Israel as a nation, the concept of the tribes, you know right at the middle of the nation was the tabernacle, the presence and the dwelling of God. Not only that, but right in the middle of the dwelling place of God was the Ark of the Covenant. And next week's question is what was in the covenant? Uh, the, what was in the box? What was in the Ark? And how are those objects um, applicable and relatable to the nature of God? who his eternal character and what is important to him to be central to the operation of a kingdom uh, mandate to see the world repaired. As always, I wish I could keep on going, but our time is up. I can hear Hezekiah kicking and screaming, wanting to see me. So um, I will love you and leave you there. Um, if you've got any questions, um, feel free to pop them on the chat. I know Geraldine, um, you asked again for me to mention um, what me and Lara do with the King's Table, that's what we call it, um, where we gather large groups of people um, and small groups of people um, uh, and we do we take them through a, a wonderful encounter with the Holy Spirit, focusing first of all on Passover, um, unleavened bread and first first fruits. Um, we, we do that as an experience. We've done that quite a few times with the school. School of Ministry. Uh, we don't yet have a website. Uh, you won't be able to find us anywhere, which I know is awful, uh, but uh, having a child means things seem to go quite slow. Um, but you will you will hear about it. When, when things get back to normal and we can start meeting together, um, I know it's very much on uh, church's heart uh, to do one as a church-wide community, and we were supposed to do one for the school. Um, in April but that got closed down but I know Hannah will have us back so you will you will be able to get involved um, just keep your ear uh, to the ground um, and uh, we will we'll get the word out it will probably be through church suite but it it won't be yet it won't be until we can start meeting together um, eating together is a whole nother thing um, so yeah but bless you guys have an amazing uh, last few hours of Pentecost um, and obviously it go, does go in, in into tomorrow um, and uh, just hold in your hearts uh, that revelation of the gift that was given um, for the church and the gift that was given at Mount Sinai, how they um, point to uh, the one that they're entering into marriage with. Um, there was obviously no delay. God didn't go anywhere when they married Yahweh. Here's an interesting thought to leave you with. The Jews married Yahweh the Father, the church will marry Jesus the Son. Okay, alright, love you. I'll leave you there.